Chapter One The Science of Deduction Sherlock Holmes took his bottle from the corner of the mantelpiece and his hypodermic syringe from its neat Morocco case. With his long, white, nervous fingers, he adjusted the delicate needle and rolled back his left shirt cuff. For some little time, his eyes rested thoughtfully upon the sinewy forearm and wrist all dotted and scarred with innumerable puncture marks. Finally, he thrust the sharp point home, pressed down the tiny piston, and sank back into the velvet-lined armchair with a long sigh of satisfaction. Three times a day for many months I had witnessed this performance, but custom had not reconciled my mind to it. On the contrary, from day to day I had become more irritable at the sight, and my conscience swelled nightly within me at the thought that I had lacked the courage to protest. Again and again I had registered a vow that I should deliver my soul upon the subject. But there was that in the cool, nonchalant air of my companion which made him the last man with whom one would care to take anything approaching to a liberty. His great powers, his masterly manner, and the experience which I had had of his many extraordinary qualities, all made me diffident and backward in crossing him. Yet upon that afternoon, whether it was the bone which I had taken with my lunch, or the additional exasperation produced by the extreme deliberation of his manner, I suddenly felt that I could hold out no longer. "'Which is it today?' I asked. "'Morphine or cocaine?' He raised his eyes languidly from the old black-letter volume which he had opened. "'It is cocaine,' he said. "'A seven per cent solution. Would you care to try it?' "'No, indeed,' I answered brusquely. "'My constitution has not got over the Afghan campaign yet. I cannot afford to throw any extra strain upon it.' He smiled at my vehemence. "'Perhaps you are right, Watson,' he said. "'I suppose that its influence is physically a bad one. I find it, however, so transcendently stimulating and clarifying to the mind that its secondary action is a matter of small moment. "'But consider,' I said earnestly, "'count the cost. Your brain may, as you say, be roused and excited, but it is a pathological and morbid process which involves increased tissue change, and may at last leave a permanent weakness. You know, too, what a black reaction comes upon you. Surely the game is hardly worth the candle. Why should you, for a mere passing pleasure, risk the loss of those great powers with which you have been endowed? Remember that I speak not only as one comrade to another, but as a medical man to one for whose constitution he is to some extent answerable. He did not seem offended. On the contrary, he put his fingertips together, and leaned his elbows on the arms of his chair, like one who has a relish for conversation. "'My mind,' he says, "'rebels at stagnation. Give me the problems, give me work, give me the most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis, and I am in my own proper atmosphere. I can dispense, then, with artificial stimulants. But I abhor the dull routine of existence.' I crave for mental exaltation. That is why I have chosen my own particular profession, or rather created it, for I am the only one in the world. The only unofficial detective, I said, raising my eyebrows. The only unofficial consulting detective, he answered. I am the last and highest court of appeal in detection. When Gregson or Lestrade or Athelney Jones are out of their depths, which, by the way, is their normal state, the matter is laid before me. I examine the data, as an expert, and pronounce a specialist's opinion. I claim no credit in such cases. My name figures in no newspaper. The work itself, the pleasure of finding a field for my peculiar powers, is my highest reward." but you have yourself had some experience of my methods of work in the Jefferson Hope case. "'Yes, indeed,' said I cordially. "'I was never so struck by anything in my life. I even embodied it in a small brochure with the somewhat fantastic title of A Study in Scarlet.' 
he shook his head sadly i glanced over it said he honestly i cannot congratulate you upon it detection is or ought to be an exact science and should be treated in the same cold and unemotional manner you have attempted to tinge it with romanticism which produces much the same effect as if you worked a love story or an elopement into the fifth proposition of euclid but the romance was there i remonstrated i could not tamper with the facts some facts should be suppressed or at least a just sense of proportion should be observed in treating them the only point in the case which deserved mention was the curious analytical reasoning from effects to causes by which i succeeded in unravelling it i was annoyed at his criticism of a work which had been especially designed to please him i confess too that i was irritated by the egotism which seemed to demand that every line of my pamphlet should be devoted to his own special doings more than once during the years that i had lived with him in baker street i had observed that a small vanity underlay my companion's quiet and didactic manner i make no remark however but sat nursing my wounded leg i had a gisale bullet through it some time before and though it did not prevent me from walking it ached wearily at every change of the weather my practice has extended recently to the continent said holmes after a while filling up his old briar root pipe i was consulted last week by francois le Villard, who as you probably know has come rather to the front lately in the french detective service he has all the celtic power of quick intuition but he is deficient in the wide range of exact knowledge which is essential to the higher developments of his art the case was concerned with a will and possessed some features of interest i was able to refer him to two parallel cases the one at riga in 1857 and the other at st louis in 1871 which have suggested to him the true solution here is the letter which i had this morning acknowledging my assistance he tossed over as he spoke a crumpled sheet of foreign notepaper i glanced my eyes down it catching a profusion of notes of admiration with stray magnifique coup de maître and tour de force all testifying to the ardent admiration of the frenchman he speaks as a pupil to his master said i oh he rates my assistance too highly said sherlock holmes lightly he has considerable gifts himself he possesses two of the three qualities necessary for the ideal detective he has the power of observation and that of deduction he is only wanting in knowledge and that may come in time he is now translating my small works into french your works oh didn't you know he cried laughing <laughs> yes i have been guilty of several monographs they are all upon technical subjects here for example is one upon the distinction between the ashes of the various tobaccos in it i enumerate a hundred and forty forms of cigar cigarette and pipe tobacco with coloured plates illustrating the difference in the ash it is a point which is continually turning up in criminal trials and which is sometimes of supreme importance as a clue if you can say definitely for example that some murder has been done by a man who was smoking an indian lunka it obviously narrows your field of search to the trained eye there is as much difference between the black ash of a trichinopoly and the white fluff of bird's eye as there is between a cabbage and a potato you have an extraordinary genius for minutiae i remarked i appreciate their importance here is my monograph upon the tracing of footsteps with some remarks upon the uses of plaster of paris as a preserver of impresses here too is a curious little work upon the influence of a trade upon the form of the hand with lithotypes of the hands of slaters sailors cork cutters compositors weavers and diamond polishers that is a matter of great practical interest to the scientific detective especially in cases of unclaimed bodies or in discovering the antecedents of criminals 
but i weary you with my hobby not at all i answered earnestly it is of the greatest interest to me especially since i have had the opportunity of observing your practical application of it but you spoke just now of observation and deduction surely the one to some extent implies the other why hardly he answered leaning back luxuriously in his armchair and sending up thick blue wreaths from his pipe for example observation shows me that you have been to the wigmore street post office this morning but deduction lets me know that when there you dispatched a telegram right said i right on both points but i confess that i don't see how you arrived at it it was a sudden impulse on my part and i have mentioned it to no one it is simplicity itself he remarked chuckling at my surprise <laughs> so absurdly simple that an explanation is superfluous and yet it may serve to define the limits of observation and of deduction observation tells me that you have a little reddish mould adhering to your instep just opposite the seymour street office they have taken up the pavement and thrown up some earth which lies in such a way that it is difficult to avoid treading in it in entering the earth is of this peculiar reddish tint which is found as far as i know nowhere else in the neighbourhood so much is observation the rest is deduction how then did you deduce the telegram why of course i knew that you had not written a letter since i sat opposite to you all morning i see also in your open desk there that you have a sheet of stamps and a thick bundle of postcards what could you go into the post office for then but to send a wire eliminate all other factors and the one which remains must be the truth in this case it certainly is so i replied after a little thought the thing however is as you say of the simplest would you think me impertinent if i were to put your theories to a more severe test on the contrary he answered it would prevent me from taking a second dose of cocaine i should be delighted to look into any problem which you might submit to me i've heard you say that it's difficult for a man to have any object in daily use without leaving the impress of his individuality upon it in such a way that a trained observer might read it now i have here a watch which has recently come into my possession would you have the kindness to let me have an opinion upon the character or habits of the late owner i handed him over the watch with some slight feeling of amusement in my heart for the test was as i thought an impossible one and i intended it as a lesson against the somewhat dogmatic tone which he occasionally assumed he balanced the watch in his hand gazed hard at the dial opened the back and examined the works first with his naked eyes and then with a powerful convex lens i could hardly keep from smiling at his crestfallen face when he finally snapped the case to and handed it back there are hardly any data he remarked the watch has been recently cleaned which robs me of my most suggestive facts you're right i answered it was clean before being sent to me in my heart i accused my companion of putting forward a most lame and impotent excuse to cover his failure what data could he expect from an uncleaned watch though unsatisfactory my research has not been entirely barren he observed staring up at the ceiling with dreamy lacklustre eyes subject to your correction i should judge that the watch belonged to your elder brother who inherited it from your father that you gather no doubt from the h w on the back quite so the w suggests your own name the date of the watch is nearly fifty years back and the initials are as old as the watch so it was made for the last generation jewelry usually descends to the eldest son and he is most likely to have the same name as the father your father has if i remember right been dead many years it has therefore been in the hands of your eldest brother right so far said i 
anything else he was a man of untidy habits very untidy and careless he was left with good prospects but he threw away his chances lived for some time in poverty with occasional short intervals of prosperity and finally taking to drink he died and that is all i can gather i sprang from my chair and limped impatiently about the room with considerable bitterness in my heart this is unworthy of you holmes i said i could not have believed that you would have descended to this you have made inquiries into the history of my unhappy brother and you now pretend to deduce this knowledge in some fanciful way you cannot expect me to believe that you've read all this from his old watch it is unkind and to speak plainly has a touch of charlatanism in it my dear doctor said he kindly pray accept my apologies viewing the matter as an abstract problem i had forgotten how personal and painful a thing it might be to you i assure you however that i never even knew that you had a brother until you handed me the watch then how in the name of all that is wonderful did you get these facts they're absolutely correct in every particular ah that is good luck i could only say what was the balance of probability i did not at all expect to be so accurate but it was not mere guesswork no no i never guess it is a shocking habit destructive to the logical faculty what seems strange to you is only so because you do not follow my train of thought or observe the small facts upon which large inferences may depend for example i began by stating that your brother was careless when you observe the lower part of that watch case you notice that it is not only dinted in two places but it is cut and marked all over from the habit of keeping other hard objects such as keys or coins in the same pocket surely it is no great feat to assume that a man who treats a fifty guinea watch so cavalierly must be a careless man neither is it a very far-fetched inference that a man who inherits one article of such value is pretty well provided for in other respects i nodded to show that i followed his reasoning it is very customary for pawnbrokers in england when they take a watch to scratch the number of the ticket with a pinpoint upon the inside of the case it is more handy than a label as there is no risk of the number being lost or transposed there are no less than four such numbers visible to my lens on the inside of this case inference that your brother was often at low water secondary inference that he had occasional bursts of prosperity or he could not have redeemed the pledge finally i ask you to look at the inner plate which contains the keyhole look at the thousands of scratches all round the hole marks where the key has slipped what sober man's key could have scored those grooves but you will never see a drunkard's watch without them he winds it at night and he leaves these traces of his unsteady hand where is the mystery in all this it is as clear as daylight i answered i regret the injustice which i did you i should have had more faith in your marvellous faculty may i ask whether you have any professional inquiry on foot at present none hence the cocaine i cannot live without brain work what else is there to live for stand at the window here was ever such a dreary dismal unprofitable world see how the yellow fog swirls down the street and drifts across the dun-coloured houses what could be more hopelessly prosaic and material what is the use of having powers doctor when one has no field upon which to exert them crime is commonplace existence is commonplace and no qualities save those which are commonplace have any function upon earth i had opened my mouth to reply to this tirade when with a crisp knock our landlady entered bearing a card upon the brass salver a young lady for you sir she said addressing my companion miss mary morstan he read hmm i have no recollection of the name 
"'Ask the young lady to step up, Mrs. Hudson. "'Don't go, Doctor. "'I should prefer that you remain.'" End of chapter 1chapter two the statement of the case miss morstan entered the room with a firm step and an outward composure of manner she was a blonde young lady small dainty well gloved and dressed in the most perfect taste there was however a plainness and simplicity about her costume which bore with it a suggestion of limited means the dress was a sombre greyish beige untrimmed and unbraided and she wore a small turban of the same dull hue, relieved only by a suspicion of white feather in the side. Her face had neither regularity of feature nor beauty of complexion, but her expression was sweet and amiable, and her large blue eyes were singularly spiritual and sympathetic. In an experience of women which extends over many nations and three separate continents, I have never looked upon a face which gave a clearer promise of a refined and sensitive nature. I could not but observe that as she took the seat which Sherlock Holmes placed for her, her lip trembled, her hand quivered, and she showed every sign of intense inward agitation. "'I have come to you, Mr. Holmes,' she said, "'because you once enabled my employer, Mrs. Cecil Forrester, to unravel a little domestic complication.' She was much impressed by your kindness and skill. Mrs. Cecil Forrester, he repeated thoughtfully. I believe that I was of some slight service to her. The case, however, as I remember it, was a very simple one. She did not think so, but at least you cannot say the same of mine. I can hardly imagine anything more strange, more utterly inexplicable, than the situation in which I find myself. Holmes rubbed his hands, and his eyes glistened. He leaned forward in his chair with an expression of extraordinary concentration upon his clear-cut, hawk-like features. "'State your case,' said he in brisk business tones. I felt that my position was an embarrassing one. Uh, "'You will, I am sure, excuse me,' I said, rising from my chair. To my surprise, the young lady held up her gloved hand to detain me. "'If your friend,' she said, "'would be good enough to stop, "'he might be of inestimable service to me.' "'I relapsed into my chair. "'Briefly,' she continued, "'the facts are these. "'My father was an officer in an Indian regiment "'who sent me home when I was quite a child. "'My mother was dead, and I had no relative in England. "'I was placed, however, in a comfortable boarding establishment at Edinburgh, and there I remained until I was seventeen years of age. In the year 1878, my father, who was senior captain of his regiment, obtained twelve months' leave and came home. He telegraphed to me from London that he had arrived all safe and directed me to come down at once, giving the Langham Hotel as his address. His message, as I remember, was full of kindness and love. On reaching London, I drove to the Langham, and was informed that Captain Morstan was staying there, but that he had gone out the night before, and had not yet returned. I waited all day without news of him. That night, on the advice of the manager of the hotel, I communicated with the police, and next morning we advertised in all the papers. Our inquiries led to no result, and from that day to this, no word has ever been heard of my unfortunate father. He came home with his heart full of hope, to find some peace, some comfort, and instead, she put her hand to her throat, and a choking sob cut short the sentence. The date? asked Holmes, opening his notebook. He, he, he disappeared upon the 3rd of December, 1878, nearly ten years ago. His luggage remained at the hotel. There was nothing in it to suggest a clue, some clothes, some books, and a considerable number of curiosities from the Adaman Islands. He had been one of the officers in charge of the convict guard there. Had he any friends in town? 
only one that we know of major sholto of his own regiment the thirty-fourth bombay infantry the major had retired some little time before and lived at upper norwood we communicated with him of course but he did not even know that his brother officer was in england a singular case remarked holmes i have not yet described to you the most singular part about six years ago to be exact upon the fourth of may eighteen eighty two an advertisement appeared in the times asking for the address of miss mary morstan and stating that it would be to her advantage to come forward there was no name or address appended i had at that time just entered the family of mrs cecil forrester in the capacity of governess by her advice i published my address in the advertisement column the same day there arrived through the post a small cardboard box addressed to me which i found to contain a very large and lustrous pearl no word of writing was enclosed since then every year upon the same date there has always appeared a similar box containing a similar pearl without any clue as to the sender they have been pronounced by an expert to be of a rare variety and of considerable value you can see for yourselves that they are very handsome she opened a flat box as she spoke and showed me six of the finest pearls that i had ever seen your statement is most interesting said sherlock holmes has anything else occurred to you yes and no later than today that is why i have come to you this morning i received this letter which you will perhaps read for yourself thank you said holmes the envelope too please postmark london southwest date july seventh hmm man's thumb mark on corner probably postman best quality paper envelopes at sixpence a packet particular man in his stationery no address be at the third pillar from the left outside the lyceum theater tonight at seven o'clock if you are distrustful bring two friends you are a wronged woman and you shall have justice do not bring police if you do all will be in vain your unknown friend well really this is a very pretty little mystery what do you intend to do miss morstan that is exactly what i want to ask you then we shall most certainly go you and i and yes why dr watson is the very man your correspondent says two friends he and i have worked together before but would he come she asked with something appealing in her voice and expression i should be proud and happy said i fervently if i can be of any service you are both very kind she answered i have led a retired life and have no friends whom i could appeal to if i am here at six it will do i suppose you must not be later said holmes there is one other point however is this handwriting the same as that upon the pearl box addresses i have them here she answered producing half a dozen pieces of paper you are certainly a model client you have the correct intuition let us see now he spread out the papers upon the table and gave little darting glances from one to the other they are disguised hands except the letter he said presently but there can be no question as to the authorship see how the irrepressible greek e will break out and see the twirl of the final s they are undoubtedly by the same person i should not like to suggest false hopes miss morstan but is there any resemblance between this hand and that of your father nothing could be more unlike i expected to hear you say so we shall look out for you then at six pray allow me to keep the papers i may look into the matter before then it is only half past three au revoir then au revoir said our visitor and with a bright kindly glance from one to the other of us she replaced her pearl box in her bosom and hurried away standing at the window i watched her walking briskly down the street until the grey turban and white feather 
were but a speck in the sombre crowd. "'What a very attractive woman!' I exclaimed, turning to my companion. He had lit his pipe again, and was leaning back with drooping eyelids. "'Is she?' he said languidly. "'I did not observe.' "'You really are an automaton, a calculating machine,' I cried. "'There's something positively inhuman in you at times.' He smiled gently. "'It is of the first importance,' he said, "'not to allow your judgment to be biased by personal qualities. A client is to me a mere unit, a factor in a problem. The emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear reasoning. I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. And the most repellent man of my acquaintance is a philanthropist who has spent nearly a quarter of a million upon the London poor. In this case, however, I never make exceptions. An exception disproves the rule. Have you ever had occasion to study character in handwriting? What do you make of this fellow's scribble? It is legible and regular, I answered a man of business habits, and some force of character. Holmes shook his head. "'Look at his long letters,' he said. "'They hardly rise above the common herd. That D might be an A, and that L an E. Men of character always differentiate their long letters, however illegibly they may write. There is vacillation in his K's, and self-esteem in his capitals. I am going out now.' I have some few references to make. Let me recommend this book, one of the most remarkable ever penned. It is Winwood Reed's Martyrdom of Man. I shall be back in an hour. I sat in the window with the volume in my hand, but my thoughts were far from the daring speculations of the writer. My mind ran upon our late visitor. Her smiles, the deep rich tones of her voice, the strange mystery which overhung her life. If she was seventeen at the time of her father's disappearance, she must be seven-and-twenty now, a sweet age when youth has lost its self-consciousness and become a little sobered by experience. So I sat and mused until such dangerous thoughts came into my head that I hurried away to my desk and plunged furiously into the latest treatise upon pathology. What was I, an army surgeon with a weak leg and a weaker banking account, that I should dare to think of such things. She was a unit, a factor, nothing more. If my future were black, it was better, surely, to face it like a man than to attempt to brighten it by mere will-o'-the-wisps of the imagination. End of chapter 2《In Quest of a Solution》It was half-past five before Holmes returned. He was bright, eager, and in excellent spirits, a mood which in his case alternated with fits of the blackest depression. "'There is no great mystery in this matter,' he said, taking the cup of tea which I had poured out for him. "'The facts appear to admit of only one explanation. "'What, you've sold it already?' "'Well, that would be too much to say i have discovered a suggestive fact that is all it is however very suggestive the details are still to be added i have just found on consulting the back files of the times that major sholto of upper norwood late of the thirty fourth bombay infantry died upon the twenty eighth of april eighteen eighty two i may be very obtuse holmes but I fail to see what this suggests. No, you surprise me. Look at it in this way, then. Captain Morstan disappears. The only person in London whom he could have visited is Major Sholto. Major Sholto denies having heard that he was in London. Four years later, Sholto dies. Within a week of his death, Captain Morstan's daughter receives a valuable present, which is repeated from year to year, and now culminates in a letter which describes her as a wronged woman. What wrong can it refer to except this deprivation of her father? And why should the presence begin immediately after Sholto's death, unless it is that Sholto's heir knows something of the mystery 
and desires to make compensation have you any alternative theory which will meet the facts but what a strange compensation and how strangely made why too should he write a letter now rather than six years ago again the letter speaks of giving her justice what justice can she have it is too much to suppose that her father is still alive there is no other injustice in her case that you know of there are difficulties there are certainly difficulties said sherlock holmes pensively but our expedition of to-night will solve them all ah here is a four-wheeler and miss morstan is inside are you all ready then we had better go down for it is a little past the hour i picked up my hat and my heaviest stick but i observed that holmes took his revolver from his drawer and slipped it into his pocket it was clear that he thought that our night's work might be a serious one miss morstan was muffled in a dark cloak and her sensitive face was composed but pale she must have been more than woman if she did not feel some uneasiness at the strange enterprise upon which we were embarking yet her self-control was perfect and she readily answered the few additional questions which sherlock holmes put to her major sholto was a very particular friend of papa's she said his letters were full of allusions to the major he and papa were in command of the troops at the andaman islands so they were thrown a great deal together by the way a curious paper was found in papa's desk which no one could understand i don't suppose that it is of the slightest importance but i thought you might care to see it so i brought it with me it is here holmes unfolded the paper carefully and smoothed it out upon his knee he then very methodically examined it all over with his double lens it is paper of native indian manufacture he remarked it has at some time been pinned to a board the diagram upon it appears to be a plan of part of a large building with numerous halls corridors and passages at one point is a small cross done in red ink and above it is a 337 from left in faded pencil writing in the left hand corner is a curious hieroglyphic like four crosses in a line with their arms touching beside it is written in very rough and coarse characters the sign of the four jonathan small mahomet singh abdullah khan dost akbar no i confess that i do not see how this bears upon the matter yet it is evidently a document of importance it has been kept carefully in a pocket-book for the one side is as clean as the other it was in this pocket-book that we found it preserve it carefully then miss morstan for it may prove to be of use to us i begin to suspect that this matter may turn out to be much deeper and more subtle than i at first supposed i must reconsider my ideas he leaned back in the cab and i could see by his drawn brow and his vacant eye that he was thinking intently miss morstan and i chatted in an undertone about our present expedition and its possible outcome but our companion maintained his impenetrable reserve until the end of our journey it was a september evening and not yet seven o'clock but the day had been a dreary one and a dense drizzly fog lay low upon the great city mud-coloured clouds drooped sadly over the muddy streets down the strand the lamps were but misty splotches of diffused light which threw a feeble circular glimmer upon the slimy pavement the yellow glare from the shop windows streamed out into the steamy vaporous air and threw a murky shifting radiance across the crowded thoroughfare there was to my mind something eerie and ghost-like in the endless procession of faces which flitted across these narrow bars of light sad faces and glad haggard and merry like all humankind they flitted from the gloom into the light and so back into the gloom once more i am not subject to impressions but the dull heavy evening with the strange business upon which we were engaged combined to make me nervous and depressed i could see from miss morstan's manner that she was suffering from the same feeling holmes alone could rise superior to petty influences 
he held his open notebook upon his knee and from time to time he jotted down figures and memoranda in the light of his pocket lantern at the lyceum theatre the crowds were already thick at the side entrances in front a continuous stream of hansoms and four-wheelers were rattling up discharging their cargoes of shirt-fronted men and beshawled bediamonded women we'd hardly reached the third pillar which was our rendezvous before a small dark brisk man in the dress of a coachman accosted us are you the parties who come with the miss morstan he asked i am miss morstan and these two gentlemen are my friends said she he bent a pair of wonderfully penetrating and questioning eyes upon us you will excuse me miss he said with a certain dogged manner but i was to ask you to give me your word that neither of your companions is a police officer i give you my word on that she answered he gave a shrill whistle on which a street arab led across a four-wheeler and opened the door the man who had addressed us mounted to the box while we took our places inside we had hardly done so before the driver whipped up his horse and we plunged away at a furious pace through the foggy streets the situation was a curious one we were driving to an unknown place on an unknown errand yet our invitation was either a complete hoax which was an inconceivable hypothesis or else we had good reason to think that important issues might hang upon our journey miss morstan's demeanor was as resolute and collected as ever i endeavored to cheer and amuse her by reminiscences of my adventures in afghanistan but to tell the truth i was myself so excited at our situation and so curious as to our destination that my stories were slightly involved to this day she declares that i told her one moving anecdote as to how a musket looked into my tent at the dead of night and how i fired a double-barrelled tiger cub at it at first i had some idea as to the direction in which we were driving but soon what with our pace the fog and my own limited knowledge of london i lost my bearings and knew nothing save that we seemed to be going a very long way sherlock holmes was never at fault however and he muttered the names as the cab rattled through squares and in and out by tortuous by streets rochester row said he now vincent square now we come out on the vauxhall bridge road we're making for the surrey side apparently yes i thought so now we're on the bridge you can catch glimpses of the river we did indeed get a fleeting view of a stretch of the thames with the lamps shining upon the broad silent water but our cab dashed on and was soon involved in a labyrinth of streets upon the other side wordsworth road said my companion priory road lark hall lane stockwell place robert street cold harbour lane our quest does not appear to take us to very fashionable regions we had indeed reached a questionable and forbidding neighbourhood long lines of dull brick houses were only relieved by the coarse glare and tawdry brilliancy of public houses at the corner then came rows of two-storied villas each with a fronting of miniature garden and then again interminable lines of new staring brick buildings the monster tentacles which the giant city was throwing out into the country at last the cab drew up at the third house in a new terrace none of the other houses were inhabited and that at which we stopped was as dark as its neighbours save for a single glimmer in the kitchen window on our knocking however the door was instantly thrown open by a hindu servant clad in a yellow turban white loose-fitting clothes and a yellow sash there was something strangely incongruous in this oriental figure framed in the commonplace doorway of a third-rate suburban dwelling-house the saiba waits you said he and even as he spoke there came a high piping voice from some inner room show them in to me kitmuga it cried show them straight in to me end of chapter three chapter four of the sign of the four by sir arthur conan doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four 
the story of the bald-headed man we followed the indian down a sordid and common passage ill-lit and worse furnished until he came to a door upon the right which he threw open a blaze of yellow light streamed out upon us and in the centre of the glare there stood a small man with a very high head a bristle of red hair all round the fringe of it and a bald shining scalp which shot out from among it like a mountain peak from fir trees he writhed his hands together as he stood and his features were in a perpetual jerk now smiling now scowling but never for an instant in repose nature had given him a pendulous lip and a too visible line of yellow and irregular teeth which he strove feebly to conceal by constantly passing his hand over the lower part of his face in spite of his obtrusive baldness he gave the impression of youth in point of fact he had just turned his thirtieth year your servant miss morstan he kept repeating in a thin high voice your servant gentlemen pray step into my little sanctum a small place miss but furnished to my own liking an oasis of art in the howling desert of south london we were all astonished by the appearance of the apartment into which he invited us in that sorry house it looked as out of place as a diamond of the first water in a setting of brass the richest and glossiest of curtains and tapestries draped the walls looped back here and there to expose some richly mounted painting or oriental vase the carpet was of amber and black so soft and so thick that the foot sank pleasantly into it as into a bed of moss two great tiger skins thrown athwart it increased the suggestion of eastern luxury as did a huge hookah which stood upon a mat in the corner a lamp in the fashion of a silver dove was hung from an almost invisible golden wire in the centre of the room as it burned it filled the air with a subtle and aromatic odour mr thaddeus sholto said the little man still jerking and smiling that is my name you are miss morstan of course and these gentlemen this is mr sherlock holmes and this is dr watson ah doctor hey cried he much excited have you your stethoscope might i ask you would you have the kindness i have grave doubts as to my mitral valve if you would be so very good the aortic i may rely upon but i should value your opinion upon the mitral i listened to his heart as requested but was unable to find anything amiss save indeed that he was in an ecstasy of fear for he shivered from head to foot it appears to be normal i said you have no cause for uneasiness you will excuse my anxiety miss morstan he remarked airily i am a great sufferer and i have long had suspicions as to that valve i am delighted to hear that they are unwarranted had your father miss morstan refrained from throwing a strain upon his heart he might have been alive now i could have struck the man across the face so hot was i at this callous and off-hand reference to so delicate a matter miss morstan sat down and her face grew white to the lips i knew in my heart that he was dead said she i can give you every information said he and what is more i can do you justice and i will too whatever brother bartholomew may say i am so glad to have your friends here not only as an escort to you but also as witnesses to what i am about to do and say the three of us can show a bold front to brother bartholomew but let us have no outsiders no police or officials we can settle everything satisfactorily among ourselves without any interference nothing would annoy brother bartholomew more than any publicity he sat down upon a low settee and blinked at us inquiringly with his weak watery blue eyes for my part said holmes whatever you may choose to say will go no further i nodded to show my agreement that is well that is well said he may i offer you a glass of chianti miss morstan or of tokay i keep no other wines shall i open a flask no well then i trust that you have no objection to tobacco smoke to the mild balsamic odour of the eastern tobacco i am a little nervous and i find my hookah an invaluable sedative 
he applied a taper to the great bowl and the smoke bubbled merrily through the rose water we sat all three in a semicircle with our heads advanced and our chins upon our hands while the strange jerky little fellow with his high shining head puffed uneasily in the centre when i first determined to make this communication to you said he i might have given you my address but i feared that you might disregard my request and bring unpleasant people with you i took the liberty therefore of making an appointment in such a way that my man williams might be able to see you first i have complete confidence in his discretion and he had orders if he were dissatisfied to proceed no further in the matter you will excuse these precautions but i am a man of somewhat retiring and i might even say refined tastes and there is nothing more unesthetic than a policeman i have a natural shrinking from all forms of rough materialism i seldom come in contact with the rough crowd i live as you see with some little atmosphere of elegance around me i may call myself a patron of the arts it is my weakness the landscape is a genuine coro and though a connoisseur might perhaps throw a doubt upon that salvator rosa there cannot be the least question about the bougoreau i am partial to the modern french school you will excuse me mr sholto said miss morstan but i am here at your request to learn something which you desire to tell me it is very late and i should desire the interview to be as short as possible at the best it must take some time he answered for we shall certainly have to go to norwood and see brother bartholomew we shall all go and try if we can get the better of brother bartholomew he is very angry with me for taking the course which has seemed right to me i had quite high words with him last night you cannot imagine what a terrible fellow he is when he's angry if we're to go to norwood it would perhaps be as well to start at once i ventured to remark he laughed until his ears were quite red that would hardly do he cried i don't know what he would say if i brought you in that sudden way no i must prepare you by showing you how we all stand to each other in the first place i must tell you that there are several points in the story of which i am myself ignorant i can only lay the facts before you as far as i know them myself my father was as you may have guessed major john sholto once of the indian army he retired some eleven years ago and came to live at pondicherry lodge in upper norwood he had prospered in india and brought back with him a considerable sum of money a large collection of valuable curiosities and a staff of native servants with these advantages he bought himself a house and lived in great luxury my twin brother bartholomew and i were the only children i very well remember the sensation which was caused by the disappearance of captain morstan we read the details in the papers and knowing that he had been a friend of our father's we discussed the case freely in his presence he used to join in our speculations as to what could have happened never for an instant did we suspect that he had the whole secret hidden in his own breast that of all men he alone knew the fate of arthur morstan we did know however that some mystery some positive danger overhung our father he was very fearful of going out alone and he always employed two prize fighters to act as porters at pondicherry lodge williams who drove you tonight was one of them he was once lightweight champion of england our father would never tell us what it was he feared but he had a most marked aversion to men with wooden legs on one occasion he actually fired his revolver at a wooden-legged man who proved to be a harmless tradesman canvassing for orders we had to pay a large sum to hush the matter up my brother and i used to think this is a mere whim of my father's but events have since led us to change our opinion early in eighteen eighty two my father received a letter from india which was a great shock to him he nearly fainted at the breakfast table when he opened it and from that day he sickened to his death what was in the letter we could never discover but i could see as he held it 
that it was short and written in a scrawling hand he had suffered for years from an enlarged spleen but he now became rapidly worse and towards the end of april we were informed that he was beyond all hope and that he wished to make a last communication to us when we entered his room he was propped up with pillows and breathing heavily he besought us to lock the door and to come upon either side of the bed then grasping our hands he made a remarkable statement to us in a voice which was broken as much by emotion as by pain i shall try and give it to you in his own very words i have only one thing he said which weighs upon my mind at this supreme moment it is my treatment of poor morstan's orphan the cursed greed which has been my besetting sin through life has withheld from her the treasure half at least of which should have been hers and yet i have made no use of it myself so blind and foolish a thing is avarice the mere feeling of possession has been so dear to me that i could not bear to share it with another see that chaplet dipped with pearls beside the quinine bottle even that i could not bear to part with although i had got it out with the design of sending it to her you my sons will give her a fair share of the agra treasure but send her nothing not even the chaplet until i am gone after all men have been as bad as this and have recovered i will tell you how morstan died he continued he had suffered for years from a weak heart but he concealed it from everyone i alone knew it when in india he and i through a remarkable chain of circumstances came into possession of a considerable treasure i brought it over to england and on the night of morstan's arrival he came straight over here to claim his share he walked over from the station and was admitted by my faithful lal chowdar who is now dead morstan and i had a difference of opinion as to the division of the treasure and we came to heated words morstan had sprung out of his chair in a paroxysm of anger when he suddenly pressed his hand to his side his face turned a dusky hue and he fell backwards cutting his head against the corner of the treasure chest when i stooped over him i found to my horror that he was dead for a long time i sat half distracted wondering what i should do my first impulse was of course to call for assistance but i could not but recognize that there was every chance that i would be accused of his murder his death at the moment of a quarrel and the gash in his head would be black against me again an official inquiry could not be made without bringing out some facts about the treasure which i was particularly anxious to keep secret he had told me that no soul upon earth knew where he had gone there seemed to be no necessity why any soul ever should know i was still pondering over the matter when looking up i saw my servant lal chowdar in the doorway he stole in and bolted the door behind him do not fear sahib he said no one need know that you have killed him let us hide him from away and who is the wiser i did not kill him said i lal chowdar shook his head and smiled i heard it all sahib said he i heard you quarrel and i heard the blow but my lips are sealed all are asleep in the house let us put him away together that was enough to decide me if my own servant could not believe my innocence how could i hope to make it good before twelve foolish tradesmen in a jury box lal chowdar and i disposed of the body that night and within a few days the london papers were full of mysterious disappearance of captain morstan you will see from what i say that i can hardly be blamed in the matter my fault lies in the fact that we concealed not only the body but also the treasure and that i have clung to morstan's share as well as to my own i wish you therefore to make restitution put your ears down to my mouth the treasure is hidden in at this instant a horrible change came over his expression his eyes stared wildly his jaw dropped and he yelled in a voice which i can never forget keep him out 
for christ's sake keep him out we both stared round at the window behind us upon which his gaze was fixed a face was looking in at us out of the darkness we could see the whitening of the nose where it was pressed against the glass it was a bearded hairy face with wild cruel eyes and an expression of concentrated malevolence my brother and i rushed towards the window but the man was gone when we returned to my father his head had dropped and his pulse had ceased to beat we searched the garden that night but found no sign of the intruder save that just under the window a single footmark was visible in the flower bed but for that one trace we might have thought that our imaginations had conjured up that wild fierce face we soon however had another and a more striking proof that there were secret agencies at work all round us the window of my father's room was found open in the morning his cupboards and boxes had been rifled and upon his chest was fixed a torn piece of paper with the words the sign of the four scrawled across it what the phrase meant or who our secret visitor may have been we never knew as far as we can judge none of my father's property had been actually stolen though everything had been turned out my brother and i naturally associated this peculiar incident with the fear which haunted my father during his life but it is still a complete mystery to us the little man stopped to relight his hookah and puff thoughtfully for a few moments we had all sat absorbed listening to his extraordinary narrative at the short account of her father's death miss morstan had turned deadly white and for a moment i feared that she was about to faint she rallied however on drinking a glass of water which i quietly poured out for her from a venetian carafe upon the side table sherlock holmes leaned back in his chair with an abstracted expression and the lids drawn low over his glittering eyes as i glanced at him i could not but think how on that very day he had complained bitterly of the commonplaceness of life here at least was a problem which would tax his sagacity to the utmost mr thaddeus sholto looked from one to the other of us with an obvious pride at the effect which his story had produced and then continued between the puffs of his overgrown pipe my brother and i said he were as you may imagine much excited as to the treasure which my father had spoken of for weeks and for months we dug and delved in every part of the garden without discovering its whereabouts it was maddening to think that the hiding place was on his very lips at the moment that he died we could judge the splendor of his missing riches by the chaplet which he had taken out over this chaplet my brother bartholomew and i had some little discussion the pearls were evidently of great value and he was averse to part with them for between friends my brother was himself a little inclined to my father's fault he thought too that if we parted with the chaplet it might give rise to gossip and finally bring us into trouble it was all that i could do to persuade him to let me find out miss morstan's address and send her a detached pearl at fixed intervals so that at least she might never feel destitute it was a kindly thought said our companion earnestly it was extremely good of you the little man waved his hand deprecatingly we were your trustees he said that was the view which i took of it though brother bartholomew could not altogether see it in that light we had plenty of money ourselves i desired no more besides it would have been such bad taste to have treated a young lady in so scurvy a fashion le mauvais goût mène au crime the french have a very neat way of putting these things our difference of opinion on this subject went so far that i thought it best to set up rooms for myself so i left pondicherry lodge taking the old kitmugar and williams with me yesterday however i learn that an event of extreme importance has occurred the treasure has been discovered i instantly communicated with miss morstan and it only remains for us to drive out to norwood and demand our share 
I explained my views last night to Brother Bartholomew, so we shall be expected, if not welcome, visitors.' 